Don't let me die like this. I could accomplish so much. my own way. And those of us who have died for this sword have died in vain. I'm not sent from heaven, Father. And neither is the sword. And a great warrior will be born. One that will lead our people out of darkness and show them the way to the promised land. And that you did, Nariko. That you did. You have freed us. The promised land is here and now.
saw the truth about the sword. Others worshipped it, murdered for it, but you mastered it. And all that strength, all that beauty was your own. I won't let you down, Noriko. I'll keep the sword safe. Maybe even forgotten. But I'll always remember you. Farewell, Mariko. May we meet again in a better world. Huge sweeping vistas, enormous combat moves. Fantastic visuals, huge environments in which the action sequences take place. Our goal was to try and make one of the most beautiful games ever created. Me, like a lot of people, you know, you, you go and watch Star Wars, or you watch some big epic movie, and you walk around the street pretending as a kid that you're in that movie. What we wanted to do is make that fantasy real. So not only can you see this epic unfolding before your eyes, but you can take part in the adventure, and everything you do feels like you're in a movie. So it's kind of fulfilling a, a base childhood fantasy in all of us, I hope. Heavenly Sword is the story of Noriko, our heroine. She is a very powerful, strong young woman wielding an enormous sword. She's fit. She's got wild red hair, this mane of red hair. Beautiful skin, big, gorgeous lips, dressed very scantily. She's the hero. The Heavenly Sword is an incredibly powerful and ancient weapon. While it makes her pretty much invincible, it's also killing her. She decides to use it because she's seeking revenge for all the death and devastation that evil King Bohan has wreaked upon her land. We've got a whole host of great characters in the game from King Bohan, who's a maniacal despot, desperate to get his hands on the heavenly sword. Grant me power to send her back to the underworld. <laughs> It was fun! Through to Kai, who's actually a friend of Noriko. And she's a secondary character, you actually get to play her in the game. She's got her own unique control system. The really cool sequences that we have in the middle of combat are called the super style moves. The hero will lock onto one person and perform this most fantastic single manoeuvre which will just obliterate their opponent and also the people around them. We look at lots of different styles of martial arts and see what we can take from them and just blend it all together to make some really amazing moves. The combat engine that we have in the game allows us to have scenes where she's got up to 2,000 enemies in front of her. With the new technology that we've got, there have really been no limits to what we've tried to achieve. This is a five-year journey for us that's taken up to 100, 140 people, more if you include all the people working in New York, New Zealand and so forth. We've brought together an incredibly talented group of people from so many walks of life from all over the world. 
but it's truly international development. I hope that people really enjoy the game, that they get really engrossed in it. It's big, it's dramatic, it's film-like. If you've ever wanted to be in a blockbuster movie, you probably won't get any closer to it than having you thought. We've always been really excited by kung fu films and really over-the-top action movies. That includes the whole genre from Hong Kong movies to samurai movies to um, particularly wuxia movies. We even sat down every Friday just to watch some Asian kung fu flick. We've got a really amazing concept artist, Alessandro Taini, who created the beautiful concept art that we have. The main task was uh, to create a powerful, elegant girl, but still, still fragile, so like a human. We did have a few moments in time where we wondered whether we'd be able to create a really successful female hero. So we started to create some male equivalents. But we just knew in our heart of hearts that the male character wasn't as strong as the female character, and so we went back. I remember at one E3 show when our game was announced, 3,000 games were on show, and ours was the only original game that had a female lead. In hindsight, it was quite a bold move, but at the time it was just a sensible choice. When I knew Andy Circus was the king, this was the first paint I did. It's really important, even the crow, which is part of the costume. It's like his soul, the crow. It's like a demon. These are the first sketch for Kai, which is the other little girl. The most important thing about Kai is the animation. I wanted something uh, look like a cat and moving like a cat. So this is Kai, the archer. Before we started any in-game animations, we did a little style test. In the PlayStation 3, we can use arcs and tangents, which is kind of just the way we animate, so we get smooth organic movements. And before it would look, uh, 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 but now you kind of get deceleration and acceleration, so you get what we call squash and stretch, essentially, in the, in the animation. When we first started developing Heavenly Sword, we knew it was going to be a next-gen console game but at the time there wasn't even any development kit to begin working on. We had no real idea what the technology would be, we had no dev kits or anything, so we had to do educate guesses. We took into account Moore's Law, which states that every 18 months processing power doubles, and started developing technology on machines that weren't capable of running that technology, hoping that the next generation consoles would catch up with us. When I compare the footage that we get from PlayStation 3 to the frames of the video footage we had back then, the PlayStation footage just looks way better than we could actually create. We can certainly have greater draw distances, we can add far more polygons than we could. When you play the game, the opening shot of Chapter 2, you can see for miles and miles, and it's literally that far in the game. We've got more particles in there, we've got more storage space for textures and things like that, so we can have a great fidelity of our artwork. When you look at Nuriko or Kai, they've got really beautiful skin shaders on them, so the skin looks very, very realistic. And that ties in with the facial motion capture that we've been performing so that we get really believable expressions on their faces. This allows us to just create much more believable performances.
this beautiful girl stands in my way. We're working with Andy Serkis, who you may know as Gollum from Lord of the Rings or Kong from King Kong. He doesn't only play one of the characters in the game, King Bohan, he's also our dramatic director. The job of dramatic director um, has been, it's quite wide ranging. When you're casting, you have the conceptual artwork, so there's a, there's a pre-designed way that the character is going to finally manifest itself on screen. And yet you're trying to find the souls of these characters. Stop playing with her and kill the wretched girl! Oh, you poor little thing. <laughs> Look! <laughs> we cast a lot of theatrical actors because we knew that they had what the game needed, which was bold, interesting characters. Initially, I was a little bit um, confused because uh, I don't understand much about the technology. You're very aware that you've got 60 cameras at all times picking up everything from every angle. I mean, there's no place to hide. And you think, well, I, so I'm a series of dots then. What they are doing is building up an entire virtual map of you and the emotional input and everything that you're giving them. And once you realize that, suddenly you think, well, this is a magic suit, because once I have this ridiculous outfit on, I can purely play and just have as much fun as I can possibly get out of it. Show me some action! The interesting thing about motion capture is how liberating it is for actors, because you can play anything. You're not restricted to your own physicality, your own face. You are allowed using this medium to go anywhere. Motion capture seems to really capture the essence of the movement so much more than what a normal camera usually can. Technology nowadays does allow you to, to sculpt in the computer very similar to, to traditional sculpting. When you've seen the actors going through all these extremes of raising eyebrows and frowning, that kind of thing, we, we have to take that data and do versions of that ourselves. An angry face without these kind of wrinkle marks here on the nose and everything just isn't an angry face. It's only really with the PlayStation 3 development to allow us to have so many shapes to, to represent the skin, how it slides, how it wrinkles and creases. Stuart takes photos of us and photos of the animation of the character and superimposes them and then takes what he wants of us and what he wants of the character, which works really nicely with like uh, skin tone and things like that, so that then there's, there's kind of an essence of, of you. What is your purpose, Noriko, exactly? Mm -hmm. To die valiantly, to shed blood for a worthless cause, perhaps? Well, whatever it is, it's over. If this desire to create a new direction in gaming is, is to be successful, it's all got to be based around the, the emotional engagement of, of actors and performers and the characters they're playing. I hope people look back at this period in gaming and see this period as, as the time where games became a dramatic art form and almost vindicate us all for working in this medium for so many years. Kill her! Wipe her out! From the very beginning we wanted to create a huge cinematic experience. Part of that was to create amazing sound effects and foley. I think sound effects are often the most overlooked area of game audio. They give the player the most information and the most connection with what the character is doing. We hired a foley artist and we used him to generate all kinds of different sound effects and sound materials. <laughs> 
there's a little bit of everything here, meaning junkyardish. Every element you could possibly think of is here. Me and Marco have gone for runs out to flea markets and uh, big garbage dumps, and we look for things that would work for the video game. The best person to be attached to this project would be Marco. He's worked on hundreds and hundreds of films. This is just a small portion of the props that we have. We've got metal buckets, we've got shackles, water effects, any kind of clothing that might need rustles or different kinds of jackets, different types of metal, gates, any kind of a sound we have. With a movie, you're starting with a little bit of something and then you either add to it or you sweeten something or you replace it. With a, a video game, you need to do everything. If you don't make it, you don't have it. We get movies from Tom and we'll put it up on the screen in the Foley room and we'll play it back a few times and, and see the motions that she's doing. A lot of the times they're not rendered completely, so we're dealing with some raw footage. And so I'll ask Tom, is she on stone, is she on dirt? We look at what is occurring in that actual movie and we act out those sounds in front of a microphone. Nice. There'll be a list of things that we need to do. So if we have to run to a junkyard to find some big pieces of wood to throw around, or we have to run to a supermarket and buy some celery for bone breaks. I think a watermelon's a pretty overrated. A lot of people think they give you all this wonderful sound, but you hit a watermelon with a, a mallet and you get a, a half a second sound that doesn't have any kind of an implosion sound. Or we want something that sort of tears at the fiber of the item and just sort of rips it apart. Some of the more challenging things, I think, is some of the sword elements. The sword's not just a weapon, it's kind of a character in its own right. It's the thing that we want to use to make the player feel the most powerful. We brought swords to Heavenly Sword that we got from Crouching Tiger. In Crouching Tiger, we actually did a pass at the beginning where we used crowbars and bats and all these different things, and Ang Lee came in and goes, you know what, we need swords. A challenging part of the game is the variation. Tom will ask for uh, two or three different sword sounds. So if she's unsheathing her sword, there's going to be 20 or 30 of those sounds so that you don't hear the same sound 30 times in a row. There's a chain sequence that happens with her sword when she uses it throughout the game. It's unique to Heavenly Sword. We went out and bought as many chains as we could. Pulling back uh, the chains, throwing them around, jumping up and down. I think we even threw on a, a tape measure for the extension sounds that we had. PlayStation 3 is a surround sound environment. Most films don't even go that far. It just adds to the fantasy playing the game. Your senses are being pulled one way and another. We're trying to make it as an intense an experience as possible without making the player feel, whoa, that's, that's not real. The more challenging the sounds are, the happier we are. And if we can convey that in the game and everybody's happy, then we did our job. And, uh, and it makes it that much more exciting and happier.
One death gives reason for a second. The second lends glory to a third. And I curse the Raven Lord who lit the torch for terror in these lands. Some say he was mortal. A warlord thirsting for power. And the bloodlust and destruction he unleashed was real enough. But I say he rose from hell. The land you're standing on now was burning with hatred. Humanity itself disappearing like smoke. Our salvation. Our hope. It came from the heavens. A soldier, furious and magnificent to behold. Mighty enough to challenge even the Raven Lord. A heavenly warrior to lead mankind. And shining through the horror, such a weapon. When the battle ended and our world was saved, the heavenly warrior had vanished. Only his weapon remained. And so was born the legend of our heavenly sword. And thousands would die for it. As generations passed, the Heavenly Warrior lived on only in legend. But his sword's hold on mankind had only just begun. Salvation, survival, and peace just weren't enough. No. Men tore each other's flesh apart to wield the sword's heavenly power. They murdered for it, butchered with it, and in turn were slaughtered for clutching it. And to see this cycle of destruction, I swear it stirred the wrath of the gods. The sword itself began to feed on the bloodlust of its masters. It hungered for the souls of men. And those who wielded it would soon be consumed by it. Death, agonizing and inevitable. This sword, once a blessing upon mankind, had become a curse. And that was the beginning of our clan's story. With those first nomadic warriors who forged our legacy and duty to be sole custodians of the sword, to keep it from the grasp of mankind, and so protect the world from its insatiable appetite. Our forefathers moved ever onwards, a symbol of hope for the land. So be proud. For years, our clan sustained this tireless vigil. And as we roamed, we waited. Waited for a day of glory so long foretold, when the legendary warrior would return to these lands and reclaim his heavenly sword.